and we're back. Hello there, cartoonists and cartoon lovers. It's been two weeks. I know you've missed us. And uh, welcome to the Cartoon Pad with my co-host, Michael Shaw. I'm Bob, Hi, Bob. Eckstein. Thank you. I'm Bob Eckstein, and we have our producer, Marty, here in the, in the studio with us. And, uh, and welcome back. Hi, Marty. Hello, everybody. I've missed you. We have uh, we actually have a couple of letters we could start the show with. <gasps> wow. Yeah, let's start. Let's let's get on to this. Um, first one is um, I'm not going to mention who this is from because I don't know if they would want me to mention it, but it goes like this. Thanks for the invite. I invited this person onto the show. We all know who it is. It's a pretty big name. And he says, I appreciate it, but my attitude toward participating in showbiz has been ambivalent, ambivalent for a long time. And lately it's way more negative than positive. So sorry, uh, he's gonna pass. Ouch. Michael, I have to blame this was one that, on was you. Was that uh, Howard Stern? I, I blame this one on you for going Hollywood. I think that uh, a lot of people are associating us with showbiz and uh, we lost one there. I, I've only gone Bollywood. That's what happens. Hollywood. It's what happens when you get famous, Bob. Okay, forget it. Forget them. We're going to move on You're to the going next up. letter. We're going to go on to the next letter. This, this next letter is asking us about... Actually, this one's for our producer, Marty, more than anyone else. You, you can answer it. It's a technical question. Okay. Uh, there's a feature on podcasts that allow you to slow down or speed up the speed of the podcast as you're listening to it. Which is the best way to listen to cartoon pad? Speeding it up, or should we be asking people eight to times, slow it down? Eight times fast. Yeah. I you listen to it over. eight times fast, and you all sound like Alvin and the Chipmunks, and it's great. I can burn through an episode in 10 minutes, sometimes 20 minutes for some of your longer three hour shows. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Okay, then. So there's your answer, Lester. Lester from Poughkeepsie wrote that in. So, and thanks for listening to the show. I'm going to be more perky going forward, Michael, because I have less COVID fog now. Ooh. And so the people who have been. Have you gotten your second jab? Uh, it's coming up. I'd so, really like to give you that jab. <laughs> no, I want to thank the people who are listening and, and they ought to be. Uh, thanks for hanging in this long because. No, they uh, ought to be listening. Really. We're working hard here there you go uh, so michael what's been up with you the last two weeks anything you want to bring up uh, i got my second jab uh no uh i've just been living life really bob i've been waiting for this so i've been told that you've been drawing cartoons lefty because the one arm was sore from the shot <laughs> well being left-handed yes i have so uh uh yes i've, I've switched hands and it doesn't look any different so well, um, we have a special guest today, and um, I'm not going to say who it is, but uh, we're going to start that soon. And uh, is there any other things you want to take care of? Any more business before we bring on our guests? Well, Bob, I want to help you with something because I really enjoyed your work, but there's something I think is lacking in your cartoons. Just one thing? <laughs> Just, well, the one, the the major point that I would like to make because you have the basic elements, which is the drawing and the caption, but where I think you're really letting yourself down is in your signature. Please say more. Are you sure about this? this could well, because painful. I mean, no, the, the this is a difficult is conversation. I didn't want to bring this up, but it's been bothering me for quite a while. Of all the artists, I have the lamest signature, so I'm, no, no. You have a you have a fine signature, but it's just not taking you over the top. So what I've done is okay. I've submitted your signature to our signature an analysis here at the Cartoon Pad. So I thought I could sh uh, share with you uh, the readout and the recommendation. Oh, let me let me hear. I'm ready. Are you? No. Okay. So I'd say your current signature is a, what we would call a demonization of Robert to Bob. And it's all her case with a slightly curved line underneath. And that's sort of a smile, which is nice. But 
your signature rarely intrudes forcefully into your drawing and it usually occurs at the bottom right, sometimes at the bottom left. My nephew likes it. Yeah, I mean, it's good for nephews. I mean, come on. So, so what are you suggesting? Okay, so uh, we did a content signature analysis and we would recommend that you use your last name, Eckstein in all caps, preferably stencil style or Gothic woodcut and add the word professor in front of it and make it much larger. So you would sign all your cartoons Professor Eckstein. Not, like si like 60 font? Yes, or like uh, a woodcut, like a stamp of approval, a papal stamp of approval. What did I do to you, Michael, that <laughs> brings out this pain? <laughs> I'm just trying to help you. So, okay. you know. Michael, hold that thought. We'll get back to discussing cross-hatching later in the show because our <laughs> guest is actually here. This is a special treat. Our next guest has done it all. Multiple, multiple panel cartoons, gag cartoons, film, TV, live drawing, and writing. He has been contributing to The New Yorker since 1965, over 56 years. I was actually two years old. Only his buddy, Ed Coren, has been at The New Yorker longer. He has written and edited or illustrated over 42 books, including what is considered the ultimate book on the subject, cartooning the art and the business. I have one copy at home and one copy in my car. He has also taught cartooning for over 15 years at the New York City's Parsons School of Design. And he has won many awards. City College of New York's Townsend Harris Medal for notable achievement and the Hall of Fame honoree twice selected best magazine cartoonist of nine, excuse me of 2007 and 2008 by the National Cartoonist Society who in 2016 gave him the Tom Gill Educational Award for a lifetime outstanding contributions to the art of cartooning. Let's welcome our friend Mort Gorberg. After that introduction I should just bow, right? Now I'll go get something to eat, and that's the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Mort, I heard that uh, for your 90th birthday, you celebrated by going skiing. Was that the first time you went skiing? No, actually, the first time I went skiing uh, goes back to one of the, like, the first stories. I was in, actually in the Army uh, in Alaska, uh, and uh, through a whole lot of different things, I, I rejected a lot of the assignments that they had, and eventually I got to be the editor of the, the Post newspaper at Fort Richardson. Uh, and so being the editor, <clears throat> gave me free leave to give myself the best assignments. <clears throat> so I, I wrote, I, I did drama reviews, I did newspaper reviews. Uh, I, and then of course, someday they opened the ski bowl. That was something brand new. And I thought the ski bowl, hey, that sounds pretty good. Uh, I've been always very interested in all kinds of sports. Uh, Bob, as you know, I played on the New Yorker softball team. I was the pitcher and the second baseman for years and years and every other kind of sport. I had never skied, however, but here up in Alaska, there was a big breaking story of the new ski ball opening. And uh, so I went up there. I had never been on skis in my life. And I started you know, doing the reporting thing of asking, how does it work and how does it do it? And they said, well, you know, you ought to take a ride. I said, well, what do I do? So they put these things on my feet and they gave me a push down the hill and I learned to ski. <laughs> um, no, in, in, in truth, uh, it became an excellent or very, very high level uh, interest of mine. I skied all the places in the East. And then my brother-in-law started introduced me to Steamboat Springs, which is actually not far from here. As you probably know, I'm up here in Lakewood uh, outside of Denver. And we just uh, came out regularly, regularly, regularly. And at some point, uh, I guess it must have been now nine years ago, 10 years ago, uh, the New Yorker, which used to regularly, well, not so much really. Well, at some point they decided to uh, add some luster to the offerings for their advertisers. And they would offer these special deals where they would get a cluster of uh, cartoonists who would go on, on shipboard cruises, 
so that the uh, passengers would get to mix and mingle with them. Uh, and then they switched at one point to still I think about five or six uh, cartoonists to go out to Beaver Creek, which is one of the best uh, uh, skiing resorts out here. So then I was out here. So the point is I was not at all unfamiliar with skiing, uh, uh, although it had been about 10 years since I uh, had skied uh, various other things preventing me. And I thought, well, this would be a good time. Uh, and so my daughter who, uh, of course, is a great skier and my uh, son-in-law is a terrific skier and my uh, eight-year-old grandson and granddaughter, uh, we all packed up and we went to Vail, which is a really great thing. And they got this, uh, what they call an advanced or some kind of a, a apprentice uh, instructor to go with me. And uh, I got on the skis and there I went right down the hill. It was, uh, it was quite good. I comported myself rather well. And, uh, and actually, uh, uh, Michael, you know, you could look on Facebook or, or uh, Bob, you said you just looked on Facebook or something. Uh, go back a few weeks and you can see a video that my brother-in-law took uh, of all of us on skis, including me. And I went down the mountain. So. Yeah, Marty, I go, down on, I go down the hill, but not on skis. The skis <laughs> follow me. They, they eventually catch up to me at the bottom of the hill. Well, I know it's, 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 the way. it's terrific though. I mean, if you, if you really like Michael, go for it, you know, learn a little <laughs> bit more. I mean, it's uh, never school end. marm taught me a lesson. Oh, come on. You know, some pe- you got it. I don't, I, I'm not a skier. Bob, are you a skier? No, I, I do cross country skiing because the fall is a lot shorter. Yes. I, I like the snowshoe. I've done that too. I've done that. I've done the cross country, but I, I like I like, it's not a question of speed. I like the, the there's a, a great balance on skiing. <laughs> That's the problem. It, it, no, there really is. It's, you know, it, when I say balance, it also has to do with rhythm and it has, well, and actually that's a lot of things. I always said rhythm uh, in music, uh, it's, it's the same thing when you draw, there's a certain rhythm to a drawing. Uh, uh, and if you can, if you can translate the rhythm in your drawing properly on paper, uh, somebody looking at it will get that feeling of the drawing and it will be really smoothing that communication very well. Mark, what, what got you into cartooning in the first place? I knew you were uh, you had a comic strip in your high school newspaper, but what got you into like the single gag comic? Oh, that's a, a really, uh, the basic question, the basic answer is I don't know. Oh, uh, it's a mystery. Well, I mean, I was, I think I was admired probably when I was six years old because uh, I was able to draw Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and all those characters. I just traced them. So everybody went ooh and ah, uh, which is not unusual for all kids who eventually grow up to be cartoonists. I mean, they show some signs of uh, talent when they're very, very uh, young. Uh, I mean, uh, Another old friend, Jules Pfeiffer, tells the same thing in the Bronx. He was drawing on the sidewalk, you know, the kids. He couldn't play ball, uh, but he drew pictures, and that was this, this thing. Uh, and, of course, he was in love with Will Eisner very easily, and so he went, and that was an easy path. For me, it wasn't very, very clear. I think I was probably, if anything, steered away from it. Uh, we grew up... Uh, you know, it was, it was sort of depression times. There was not a lot of money, people earning a lot of money in the house. And uh, while I continued drawing through school, uh, yes, in high school and uh, city college, uh, and then the rest of it. And actually I had a career in advertising sales promotion uh, after the army that uh, was for six years or something. Uh, and I was gonna be a nine to five person uh, with talents being exercised in writing and drawing. Uh, sale promotion material. The thing is, I hated all that stuff and I didn't <laughs> want to do it. And uh, at some point, at some point, finally, uh, in 1960, after a rather traumatic experience in the job where I was then, uh, by putting my hand through the glass door of my office when the guy <laughs> who was my superior was correcting my copy once too many times. Wow. But I, I still have this scar right here. I almost on the, on the correct finger, I see. I would have had, yeah, that was it. Interestingly <laughs> enough, I turned it this way. This was, there you know, go. 
the way so, my, my attitudes towards life was. And that's when I started the drawing. And I said, let me try to do these drawings on a full-time basis. So you were a copywriter? No, I was uh, a combination as it, well, yes, I was a copywriter, but also because I was able to sketch and draw, right. uh, I, I would write copy pieces and then we'd be looking around for somebody to illustrate them and I was the best person to illustrate them. So I used to, you know, do the whole thing. And so writing and drawing was, uh, was always, always together. I mean, in the army, I did drawings for the stories that I wrote uh, in the newspaper. I mean, it was always like that. But uh, everybody said, this is not a job for you. This is not a job for a Jewish boy. You should go, go into <laughs> advertising. And that's why I went to City College. It was free. And I was able to do uh, uh, the, uh, the panel there, the single panel, which was the easiest thing to do, which is what I got I'd recognized. So the point is, I got into it by, because I thought, well, I'll try it. And then it's, uh, I guess, a traditional story. Well, maybe it wasn't so, not so much today, but in the, in the days when I got into it, uh, it was the 1962. Uh, two or 63 and I sold these five dollar magazines uh, all over the place and then gradually worked my way up the pecking order going to <laughs> magazines that paid more and more Saturday Evening Post look Saturday Review Saturday Evening Post Playboy I thought I sold a lot of stuff to Playboy and telling on and there was only one more place to try to get to which was of course the New Yorker and then that was the whole thing getting to it but so that was the single panel thing. But once I was there, I, I just felt I had to do, try everything else, which is, you know, what I've been doing. Marty, when, I mean, excuse me, uh, Mort, when did you go to Mexico? Well, Mexico was as a result of this finger, you know. <laughs> I, I, that was I the just, finger of fate. The fickle finger of fate. Yes. I, I sat with my hand bandaged and I thought, you know, Something's wrong here. If I'm trying to kill myself, this is not right. I'm not happy what I'm doing. I mean, I'm making some money, but I, I should just get this out of my system. So I, should, I had a car. I had a, a, a Ford Fairlane 500, a, a white hard top convertible. And I had $400. And uh, I got to decide that I was going to go to Mexico. And I was very friendly with a guy named John Wilcock, who was one of the creators of the new generation of the Village Voice. And uh, John was going to go down to start writing for Arthur Frommer. He on a whole series of books on Europe or wherever it was. Sure. Five, Ten dollars a day. Five dollars a day. Five dollars a day. Wow, that's back there. Yeah. And so I moved down to what Mexico City uh, with uh, with with John, but I could not. I mean, we were very very good friends. Um, I actually my first published drawing was of uh, illustrating a column that John had written for the Village Voice. Uh, but I couldn't stand to be in a, a room working with him. I and mean, he would have these earphones on, the music would be blasting, and it was just too much for me. And so I uh, managed by some inquiry to find this house that was in a town that then nobody ever heard of. It was a house, it was a house, somebody's house that you can live there. Uh, you can live there for nothing if you pay the back taxes in the town. Back taxes in the town with $30. I said, oh, I got $30. I'll go do it. The house came with a, a woman and her family and everything else. I went up. <laughs> Fortunately, I, I, and I, I spoke some Spanish and that was you know, quite helpful. But uh, I looked around and here was this town that, as I said before, nobody had ever heard of. And everybody was just speaking Spanish. There were about five people in the town that spoke English. And you know what the name of the town was? Los Angeles. San Miguel de Allende. Oh, sorry. That became the biggest uh, uh, rich Americano resort in the world. And uh, I lived on top of the hill. I was a hombre, el hombre de la montaña, the man on the mountain. I hardly ever came down to uh, the city in the center of town. And I really stayed up there and I just went around drawing. I taught myself to draw uh, better and sketched and drove around. I would, I would uh, ask people if they wanted to visit different parts of Mexico and they, they said they did. Then they would pay for the gas and I drove around. 
And I stayed there for a year uh, and a half. And uh, that's when I then came back and made the full push. So you basically sketched what you saw. You weren't drawing cartoons. I was sketching what I was seeing. And then I know Bob is probably hard for you to understand, but it, this must have been 60, 1960 or the late 1960. I discovered the New Yorker magazine. I was almost 30 years old and I had any you know input with the New Yorker magazine. And I looked at some of these drawings, gorgeous drawing. Leo Lorenz just knocked me out. I didn't even, I couldn't even read his name. His signature was illegible to me. But I said, <laughs> I wanted to draw like this guy. But they were all, you know, way, way, way out of my league. And I, I but then I started to do some cartoons uh, at that point. It was beyond the sketching on the, uh, you know, on the spot. Uh, I saw what the, was in the magazine. I saw what single panel cartoons really were like. Uh, it's not that I didn't know them because uh, I had done them uh, in City College and uh, in high school as a single panel. But I, I tried to learn a little bit from what I was seeing from these masterful people. Um, and I actually had a, uh, I met a, a, very, a very good person, an incredibly talented writer down there named Walter Tevis. Uh, you probably don't even know his name, but he, no. wrote, he wrote a novel that was called The Hustler. That was with Paul Newman. And yeah, Jackie I've seen the movie. Yeah, set in yeah. Cincinnati. And when he was down there with his, uh, with his uh, uh, wife and family and he had gotten uh, the money for the movie. You know how much money he got? $20,000 they paid him <laughs> for the movie, for The Hustler. And he was working on his second book, which is called The Man Who Fell to Earth, which is another big movie that uh, was made. Uh, Bob, you remember that, yeah. So was that, was anyway- that David Bowie in that movie? Yeah, the, he's the big, tall, uh, yeah, the guy, yeah. He was a- uh, The guy, David Bowie. In any case, the point, the point is that we, we, we talked to one another every week and uh, I did a bunch of cartoons and Walter said, uh, you know, I think these are good enough to send off. And I sent uh, a small batch of cartoons to Esquire magazine. And lo and behold, and one was an eight panel, eight, I'm sorry, a nine panel pantomime thing. And lo and behold, he bought it. Jerry Beatty was the uh, cartoon editor at Esquire. And I said, oh my God, well, maybe, maybe I should really go back to New York and, and really try this out. And that was uh, 19... Uh, 61. I had just turned 31, uh, 30 years old. So uh, that was the turnaround. And then I got back to New York and uh, I went back to Brooklyn, living with my parents for a while and uh, started scratching these cartoons. And uh, so you never moved to Connecticut. Connecticut? You mean, you know, with Saxon and all those other guys? Yeah, you're supposed to come in on the train on Tuesday and make the rounds and come back and be on the bar and be home by yeah. seven yeah. and live the good life. Well, there were a couple of things like that. First of all, I was never as good as any of those guys that were terrific. Second of all, uh, it seemed all very, if you'll excuse it, it, it wasn't it wasn't of my background, you know, <laughs> to be doing a lot of cocktails on the bar car uh, and living in Connecticut. It just wasn't my thing. Uh, I probably thought I was pressing my, my broken nose into the glass trying to see what the other side looked like, uh, but I didn't. Bob. I was going to say that you did share a common background with these gentlemen because they were also what ad men, right? Charles Saxon worked as an ad guy. Is, you know. Yeah, well, Charlie was doing all these wonderful ads things, though, on the strength and basis of his enormous uh, notoriety and fame that he was getting from doing these gorgeous drawings in The New Yorker. That was always going to be a great leap, you know, that if you made it into The New Yorker, you know, you, you got other platforms uh, that uh, were open to you. And uh, the, uh, well, Herb Vallon was the famous... Uh, um, agent uh, they dealt with charlie and charles adams uh as a getting them uh, uh advertising and promotion jobs so i mean flash forward 40 50 60 years already that was not such a big thing i mean i got a lot of work 
but uh, in terms of sales promotion and advertising, many of those were in the magazine. But a lot of that was on the basis uh, of my former life. I mean, I knew how to speak to clients. I knew how to point and pitch ideas that would work. I did a terrific book on Motorola. It was a 24-page insert in, uh, in, in, in the New Yorker. It was amazing that I was able to do 20, 24 variations. Actually, I probably did 40 uh, on Motorola and on what they were doing on the phone. So it was, you know, a different thing. Saxon was just flawless. He was wonderful. And uh, a lot of those guys was just, you know, beyond, beyond. But I, I didn't go out, hang out drinking with them. <laughs> That's why you're still here. That's why I'm still here, I guess. Mort, who did you hang out with at that time? Who, who became your friends? Um, well, early on, I think uh, Ed Korn, of course, was one of the first ones I met uh, early on uh, when I got down there. And actually, a lot, a lot of them were, uh, I got to meet them because I, when I came back from Mexico, I didn't want to take a regular job. But I had met uh, an editor, a friend named uh, Nat Lerman, and he was the editor of uh, Dude and Gent magazine. And I said, well, what I'll do is uh, uh, I'll, I'll offer to read slush, slush with manuscripts that were unsolicited, and they would come in over to the transom. And somebody had to go through them to see if there's anything worthwhile, you know, looking at. So I, I took this job, which was, of course, for a few hours a day, just like that, that would get me some money. Uh, reading slush but of course you know i always had a big mouth and i always had to say what i felt and i said uh first of all a lot of these stories are very good and that they look better for this magazine this magazine looks like crap <laughs> and not so only wait, one of the uh, things that looks like terrible about it because the cartoons are so bad he and that said well if you're such a smart ass you're now a cartoon editor so, so I you're became, reading you're reading slush for dude Dude and Gent magazine, yeah. Slush for Dude and Gent. <laughs> that sounds like you need to wash up when you get home. No, no, no. It was fine actually. Uh, what I, I was getting very good, uh, very good material. In fact, I really you know, I wrote, I wrote to Walter Tevis, who uh, I thought was a wonderful writer, and I, I got a lot of people to send in really well written stories. And wow. then, of course, because doing my job. I started to look in the magazines to see who I liked, you know, in terms of cartoonists. So I wrote letters to Brian Savage and to Donald mm. Riley and to Ed Fisher. I mean, the, the cream of, of the crop at that time. And Ed Corn, and much to my surprise, they all came down to show me their cartoons. And dude was, dude was paying $25. That was <laughs> That was huge. Come Did on. you hear that, Marty? $25. $25. It was enormous. And, and the Ed Fisher was coming down and, and Donald Riley. And these are people <laughs> who were selling the New Yorker. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know. Uh, this is, it's good or bad. Anyway, I got to be very friendly with, uh, uh, I think, with, with Donald. He was a little, little different, but he was wonderful guy, wonderful talent. But I think mostly Ed uh, and um, uh, there was a very wonderful guy named Bob Abel, who was an editor uh, at different publications. And I got to see him too. I think mostly uh, Bob, I, I don't really didn't really hang around with a lot of cartoonists because I think I, I was doing a lot of, of other stuff. And I, I um, there wasn't that kind of a fraternity as it were. Uh, it got to be more of a, a thing when I started selling a little bit more and tried to, let's say, better the working rights of cartoonists when we formed the Cartoonist Guild. I don't know if you ever looked that up, uh, Bob or Michael. I have, but you can elaborate. Please share with us some of that experience. Well, I mean, it was, it was the fact that uh, people uh, at the magazines or the magazines represented by the editors uh, who were probably following company policies, uh, were, were treating cartoonists like dirt, like slaves. Uh, they had these uh, practices of uh, holding material uh, uh, well longer than they, they should. They weren't paying very, very well. 
the top markets, you know, were uh, for, for entry level with $25, $35 is what the Saturday, Saturday Review was paying. Uh, Playboy, when they started coming out, was paying $150. The New Yorker, a big deal New Yorker, uh, you know, as a freelancer coming in at those days. Um, first of all, they had an interesting way of paying. They paid by the by the agate line. In wow. other words, you know what I'm talking about, Michael? Yeah, you know? space, yeah. It's space in the magazine. Exactly. So yeah. you had a, sometimes that worked well for you and sometimes it, it, it didn't. Uh, but uh, the, the good part of it was that the met that the cartoons in the magazine and the New Yorker were all shaped differently. So you had layouts that were really, really interesting. It wasn't like these, you know, these boxes that they put in now and they would make things, you know, small there. It was a, a big deal, but I would get a, a check like $127 and 53 cents. I mean, who, who, how can you go? But again, the very first sale that I made on, on, you know, I guess it's already, you know, obviously I did in my book was a full page cartoon. It's, it's a famous uh, at this point, you know, uh, uh, cathedral, which I patterned after uh, St. Patrick's. But the point was, I, maybe I got $150 for that. You know, it was, there was no, no real money. So the cartoonist guild was formed to better the working rights of the cartoonists that they shouldn't be taken advantage of. Uh, which was beholding or paying on, on publication instead of acceptance uh, and having rates raised. Uh, and uh, we did that through a bunch of activists as itself. I think they're, uh, I forget who the first, the first one may have been uh, Lee. Lee Lorenz might've been an uh, early one. Um, president, I think I followed Lee and then uh, Sam Gross was a, a president after me. And we all tried to, you know, raise these things. We even had an action that was taken <laughs> against the Saturday Review uh, that people were voted to say, we're not going to submit cartoons anymore unless you get the, the rates up. Uh, and uh, so how did is, how did Lee go from uh, activist cartoon guild to cartoon editor? Um. It wasn't, it wasn't, they, they weren't, di they were not diametrically opposed. Oh, so it wasn't an adversarial relationship. Well, I mean, Lee, uh, you know, Lee was, he followed Jim Garrity, who was the classic <clears throat> uh, editor at the New Yorker. And it was very, very clear uh, from Lee's standpoint, or from my standpoint, Lee was the best editor ever because he appreciated uh, fine drawing. He insisted on it. And when he looked at a drawing that you brought in, even a finish, if there was something a little out of whack, uh, there was no question that he was going to ask you to fix it and do it. And so mm -hmm. he was there and he was there as an art person. And uh, he was there in terms of uh, being an advocate or a leader of the guild. Um, uh, he was that as well. I mean, uh, it was there. My, my point was that there was a need for some sort of activism and the cartoonist guild, uh, Marvin Tannenberg was president also. Mort, uh, we try to get Lee on the show. We invited him. Uh, did you get to know Lee? Do I get to know Lee? Yeah. yeah during your years working with him, did you ever feel like you got to know him and spend time with him? I, I mean, he's a great cartoonist and such an instrumental part of you getting into the New Yorker. I'm wondering if you had... Well, Lee was, yeah, I loved, I, I, I liked Lee very, very much. He was very sensitive. Uh, he knew things. And also, uh, this is again a combination. Uh, you were talking before about multiple talents. Yes. Uh, I, were you in his band? Well, I was going to say I was not in his band, but I was a very, very fervent follower. Uh, Judith and I would go down in the village uh, almost every Sunday night to hear him play with the, with the Stompers. Lee Lorenz was regarded as one of the the top cornet jazz players in North America. That's how good he was. And he, uh, I just, just loved what he, he was doing. And, uh, but actually I got to tell you this one, one thing about it. So we would go a lot and it does tell the story about these combination of, of talents and things. So uh, look day at the New Yorker was uh, got to be Tuesday, not Wednesday. 
And Lee would play, of course, on Sunday night down at the Stompers. And uh, Judith and I would go down. And I just love what he does. I mean, he also did his versions of uh, Louis Armstrong singing. Not only did he play great, he just, <laughs> he just went on. So I walk in, you know, I walk in the show of my batch to Lee. And uh, he said, oh, what? He said, you know, thank you again. It was so nice of you and Judith to come down and, and, and hear and see me play. I said, Lee, you, you know, you know, you know how much I really, really enjoy this and, and do this stuff. Uh, I love to play the piano. And it's, it's one of the things I've never really gotten to do was, was to play with a group, you know, to play with a group like gig like, like you, you know, you're playing there and you're actually playing your things and, and you know, making a couple of bucks at it. He says, yeah, he said, and then you'd have two careers that you couldn't make a living out of. <laughs> So uh, I thought, oh, my God, uh, this is really it. I mean, I think I was sort of halfway in at this point to be a uh, whatever. The point was that it was just wonderful. Uh, uh, the best line I've, I've quoted to him uh, so often. Uh, and I still, it was still would like to go down and play. He was playing at Lincoln Center uh, at lunch hours uh, uh, for nothing, of course, again, with his group. So you've seen him also down there, huh? Uh, playing well no i mean that's a little before my time but i've read about it of course it's legendary how talented he was but let's make it uh clear to the audience that you play piano uh yes i play the piano uh and that, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a great i'm a great faker uh i took piano lessons actually from my mother at first she had this piano and uh we were growing up in Brooklyn, uh, a great thing uh, was as many, many families. I mean, not Irving Berlin's family, but several, <laughs> they did the same thing in the Lower East Side. They had pianos and they played and you got Gershwin that came out of that. Uh, uh, certainly I was not at that level, but my mother played the piano in her family and that was the entertainment. And that's what they all did. And uh, so she had the piano we got from my great aunts up on Riverside Drive. And uh, mom taught me the scales. And the way she did it, she had a piece of adhesive tape and she would put tape on each of the notes. This is C, G, E, F, G, A, B, C, you know, like that. And uh, then uh, after I, I knew that, she said, well, it's time to take piano lessons. And she got this uh, pianist, uh, the piano teacher in the neighborhood uh, he had a sign in the fruit store. It said music uh, lessons, piano, piano lessons, $3. That was what we paid for <laughs> a piano lesson that was in the fruit store. And the, the person that gave me the lessons, a person named Morton Estrin, who turned out years later, as I found out, to be an enormously successful uh, concert recording artist known throughout the world. Uh, and he just had taught everybody really, really, really well. Uh, I had a problem uh, when I was uh, taking lessons. I was about 10 or 11 years old. Uh, there were three things that I loved to do uh, very, very much. Um, I loved to play the piano. I really did. I didn't practice a lot because it interfered with my second interest, which was drawing pictures. So I drew that a lot. I was going to guess and baseball. That, and that I was going to say, and that was then overruled by playing punch ball in the street. See? Punch, what's punch ball? Punch ball was uh, a game that people, that kids in, in Brooklyn uh, lived in, in this Brooklyn on the streets would play because there was no field to play uh, baseball on. It was all concrete. There were no fields. We didn't have anything. We played around the cars that were parked in the street. But uh, sports was my overriding thing. I never practiced drawing. I never practiced uh, uh, the piano. And uh, I guess I was practicing uh, playing ball a lot. So uh, you flash forward to a, find a person who, uh, a jock at heart, uh, Bob Marisa, Marisa Akocella calls me the biggest uh, cartoonist jock around. So I play everything you know, that goes in. She gets a kick out of it. But instead of doing that, uh, I practicing that I just kind of faked everything else uh, and 
that sort of goes back to how it, it came about. I just did whatever came naturally to me. And so that included a lot of the piano. One thing that Martin Estrin did do, uh, he insisted that I come and see him on, on Saturday. He realized that I wasn't practicing the piano and the exercises. I wasn't playing the Clementi or certainly not the Schubert or the Bach or, or anything else. Uh, and he said, uh, come in on Saturday and I will teach you some harmony. It'll cost you a half hour, a, a dollar. So I figured for the dollar, we could do that. And I went in and he taught me the circle of fifths. And I was able to then fake everything else from that. I could read the music. But <laughs> you were I, a hoagie Carmichael at that point. Well, I have, <laughs> I have a good ear. I sang a little bit. I sing in the choir as the, the uh, uh, synagogues that I was uh, attending. And uh, sang in harmony and uh, a cappella and blah, 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 blah. So it just sort of came out. But the point is that uh, I think I had a little bit of knowledge and from the knowledge or instruction, I, I, I do the faking. And so I, I got these fake books over there and I can sit and play and sing and do that. You know, uh, my wife thinks it's terrific. And I even got to play at the New York Historical <laughs> Society yeah. and I got reviewed. So it was all right. Mark, what was the neighborhood in Brooklyn you grew up in? Uh, well, that's another one that's kind of like all over the place. Uh, my parents moved us around a lot. Uh, it was in those days where if you, uh, if you did move, you could get free rent for about three months or something like that. Uh, as I uh, think I was indicating, there was not a lot of money coming in. My, my father... Uh, was a was a, a cutter in a manufacturing plant. My mother did secretarial work and stuff like that. So we moved around a lot. But there was Fort Hamilton, uh, in uh, you know down near Fort, Fort Hamilton Park, um, in in Brooklyn. There was Flatbush. There was Bensonhurst. Um, actually, I found out I uh, I lived on West Seventh Street in Bensonhurst. Uh, six blocks away from uh, Sid Harris, who lived on West First Street. <laughs> so uh, another great cartoonist. I mean, wonderful. So there was a lot of movement around. And ultimately, uh, my family finally moved into a house that my grandfather on my father's side had built on Eastern Street uh, in Brooklyn. And, and for that, for a long time, was, uh, was another place. But it was... Uh, all I could think of was getting out of Brooklyn uh, and getting into Manhattan. That was the big thing to do. Now Brooklyn has become, you know, the hottest place in the world. Uh, <laughs> no, nobody can afford to live there. And uh, well, we're not there either. We just, you know, selling our apartment uh, on the Upper West Side now. And uh, if any of you have huge, huge, huge truckloads full of cash, uh, call me immediately and I'll get you, make you a good deal. It's all clean and wonderful. And it's a great, great apartment uh, that is there. Mort, you do know we're talking to a cartoonist here. Say it again. Yes, I am. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, and there's not much money in Punchbowl, but I did play Punchbowl growing up as well. So what is Punchbowl? Is it like Corkball? No, 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 no. You play it in the street and uh, you can play it in a lot of variety of ways, you know, with a little team, maybe two or three on a team. And uh, instead of hitting a ball, excuse me, just a second. Um, what you would do is instead of being out of the team, um, you would, um, uh, with, with three people, you would be, uh, you know, kind of like by yourself, you would hit, hit a a ball with your punt with, with your fist you would throw it up and you would i have never heard of this and then you would run to first base the second base was a sewer and the third base was the other side did of the you street. punch the first baseman no you punch the ball I oh mean, you could punch the first baseman and then like that boom. was that was probably a foul you would probably get a okay. take it. we played a lot of football also touch tackle in the streets one of the <laughs> favorite <laughs> places Go out and cut behind the Ford, yeah. you know, and, and I'll hit you with a pass there. So, yeah. Mort, what did you use for a football? We used to roll up newspaper. No, we somebody, some some rich kid on the block would have a football. So, Yo, a pot the, roast. A pot Michael, roast makes a good football. 
Yeah, you know, Michael was, Rich kids would have a stick and they would play stick. Yeah, ball. we had Even a, more played with a punch. Ball. I played wiffle ball. Come on, know, go to Walmart, did, get a wiffle ball. I did play. I did uh, stick ball too. There was a park, Cephalo Park, nearby, and we would we would pitch against the fence uh, and try to hit the ball that way. Uh, I was. I had a good eye. I was never. Uh, I I really never struck out. Uh, hey, uh, uh, Moore, you left or right handed? Well, I'm right-handed, uh, but actually, one just before we left New York City, I went down to uh, uh, Central Park to the field where the New Yorker was always playing, and I thought I would, you know, take a look and see how I was doing. I had already hurt my eye, and I was clearly not, you know, a little uh, shaky and out of balance if I was doing it. But by this time, I was, you know, pretty well known as somebody who'd been around. Uh, and I, I could at least be coaching. So I thought, well, if I'm going to go and uh, see what I can do in the field, I'll have to turn around and bat left hand. So You're I a switch hitter. Huh? Well, no. I mean, I, you know, if you stand this way, you wait for a ball, you got this eye that's looking at the pitcher. So that's not a good idea. You have to go oh. this way. So you switch to the other side. Well, I, you know, just hung out for a little bit. You know, uh, it wasn't something I was going to work on. Actually, I'm one of the things that's, that's foremost in my not my eye now is, uh, you know, how I can uh, play. I also have been a, a pretty good t- tennis player. Bob, we never got to play, did we? We kept talking about getting into a, a tennis thing. Uh, yeah. We always talk tennis a lot, but we never got on a court together. Um, in any case, um, I think it would be a little difficult running around. I tried with my daughter a couple of months ago out here. And it's really a little hard, you know, taking this thing off and trying to running around it. The glasses are really used for reading, but this is a balanced thing. And I don't want to get into it now, but it's so, so I fell on my face and that's stupid. So we could still play Sorry, uh, more. You look like the Hathaway shirt guy. You're, you look very distinguished. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. More. I'm ready for that big match. I just, now I'm ready to play for some big money. <laughs> he's like you bobby would. riggs he's a hustler that's that's what mr uh that that was mr Eckstein is over here i'm also told you're an excellent ping pong player oh that was a funny thing uh, yeah i submitted a cartoon to uh to mankoff bob mankoff and it was a a, a ping pong cartoon uh actually it was a, a caveman cartoon and these couple is playing ping pong and the other couple right outside the cave uh, commenting and saying that obviously they're evolving much faster than we are. Uh, and Bob, of course, loved the cartoon uh, because as it t- turned out, of course, he couldn't stop talking about it, about what a great ping pong player he was. Uh, and I said, oh, well, that's, you know, that's interesting. You know, everybody talks about these great things that they do. And I said, that's very nice. And, and then he said, so do you play ping pong also? And I said, yes, well, when I was at City College, I was, I was fairly good. I actually won uh, the sophomore championship. And he kind of looked at me a little bit. Oh, really? You tossed, you tossed the gauntlet. Uh, well, I mean, I was just telling what happened. I really the truth. I said I had a class late in the afternoon at Army Hall, uptown in City College. And I hated it. It was a math class, a business math class. And I, I never could make any hint a head or tail out of uh, math. I know I used to go and I used to play ping pong and I got, you know, better and better and better. And I won the championship, big deal. So he said, oh yeah, well, we have to play sometime. I said, fine, Bob, you know, you know fine, <laughs> fine, we'll play, you know, fine. And he kept coming back. He submitted the cartoon and he, I, and they bought it. So I ran in the New Yorker, you know, I had a ping pong cartoon in the New Yorker and um, I think it was about that time one of my books was coming out and uh, I think the cartoon bank was going to sell it. Uh, and he had a, a bunch of them up in the, uh, where was that place of his, Bob? Up in y- y- Yonkers, but you know, uh, wherever it was. Upstairs. Yeah, the cartoon uh, bank. Yeah. Anyway, he was up there and he said, come on up, we'll get some books in. And then he smiled and he said, oh, and I have, I have a ping pong table up there so we could play. I said, fine. I mean, whatever. So now we're talking about, <clears throat> let's see, from, 
I graduated from the city college in 52. And so maybe this particular uh, action was maybe 40 years later. And I don't think I'd play ping pong in between or whatever. Anyway, we get up there. I do some things of signing books. And he says, all right, let's go into the next room. And he comes out and he starts doing all these things. It's a new game, of course, <laughs> from what I had played 40 years ago. But after a couple of volleys, you know, I started returning and slicing and, and hitting and banging and thing. And he had this look on his face and he said, hey, you must have been, you must have been pretty good when you were younger. <laughs> which is probably one of the, the, you know, the greatest compliments you could get out of him. So thank goodness it wasn't fencing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. More I got to add that I, I played ping pong with Bob before I was submitting cartoons to him. He asked me down to spin uh, to practice oh, yeah. with him because at that time on, yeah. on 23rd street. Yeah. Yeah. Cause at yeah, the time I, I was, I was trying to go pro as a ping pong player, as a, as a goof, I wrote this piece for the New York times and I had a coach, uh, that black player, George uh, Braffwaite, who uh, was coaching at Randall's Island. And under his tutelage, I, I practiced for a few years and I tried to play tournaments and stuff. And then I finally played Bob and I couldn't get a point off of him. He wiped me off the court. Really? Yeah, I couldn't keep. But I was an awful pro, too. I mean, I. I played in the tournaments I played in. I was probably always the worst competitor of the group. Oh, I don't know. Well, I mean, Bob is not a bad player. He played with uh, Will Short a lot. Sure. I played and with I, Will too. And I went up to uh, uh, his neighborhood and I watched those tournaments play. Those guys, are, it's totally different game from the one that I used to play. And yeah. that's, that's a whole other thing. They hide the ball under their armpits before they serve it. You <laughs> oh, they were so we sneaky. Yeah, it was so unfair. I mean, yeah, it was like cheating. Oh, yeah, and sneaking and stuff. And you have to hold the ball. And he stands over on this one corner of the uh, of the table. I, I mean, hate it that. Was, yeah, uh, it, welcome to the uh, ping pong pad, everyone. Yeah. We're discussing the uh, <laughs> techniques right. of okay. ping pong and the dirty underbelly of ping pong among cartoonists. Well, Continue, more, please. I want well, to play you in ping pong and tennis, but you'd have to wear a never patch on your eye and the other on the good eye. Yeah, and I want to play you too in punch ball. Well, that would be uh, another thing. I'll have to see how it works out. I, as I say, I have my my daughter is out here, and she got to be a pretty good uh, tennis player uh, as well. I I taught her to play tennis, and she got to be actually the the captain of the of uh, the tennis team at Hunter High School. So wow. Uh, Wow. She was pretty good. So we, we're going to try to play out <laughs> here a little bit. You know, um, I fall down a lot. So that's what well, I Well, I'm going to fall down a lot if I start running around with this thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, see, I thought skiing was much easier because at least you're keeping your feet on the ground at all times. Unless you're going to do jumps, but I'm not going to do jumps. Or fall down a yeah. lot. And I'm uh, sure you went over to the Black Diamond course knowing you. <laughs> no, no. Uh, the skiing was, uh, was uh, we just did greens, maybe a blue or two. Anyway, it's there. So all of this, you see, uh, I should add, you see, was always a uh, grist for my mill. Uh, and that's why when the cartoons on, on piano playing would show up and the cartoons on uh, 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 ping pong or tennis or something else, uh, or even the, the things that I, I did, well, basketball, I mean, uh, the repertoire. In other words, I was always looking for things that I was interested in uh, to report on and to draw. I had this wonderful four-page spread about the Knicks in Madison Square Garden that I did for uh, Dick Schaap at uh, Sport Magazine. Uh, I did uh, the U.S. Open. Uh, I covered Nastasi versus... Uh, Lindell? No. No, the guy, the left-handed. He had a fast... Oh, McEnroe. No, 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 earlier oh. than he. He had oh. at one point the fastest serve. Oh, you know, uh, uh, Roscoe Tanner. Roscoe Tanner. Roscoe Tanner, right. And I think that it was only like for us, maybe 92 miles an hour. Yeah, was he was like, like no. Frankenstein. No, no, wasn't he he? Was, it was 145 miles uh, per hour. No, 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 no. <laughs> Bob, it was Bob, a million no. miles an hour. Not Tanner, not Tanner. Anyway, that's, that's, uh, I'm very pleased with that. Then sketches of that, uh, are reproduced in that book that uh, Fancy Graphics did uh, of uh, my show. 
Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. It's a beautiful uh, book, and let's let's talk about it now for wait, let me, the audience. Uh, yeah, let's yeah. give the name of it. Uh, this is, uh, well, I have it here, because I was just going to look. Uh, it's Mort Gerberg on the scene. And so these are uh, combinations of all the drawings, various... Uh, uh, here's the Democratic Convention, and uh, uh, where is the... Oh, I think the other thing is sports. This is the Democratic Convention uh, in Chicago in 68. I, I did reportage on that. So, Moore, you covered both the Democratic Convention and Nixon uh, in 1972. Yeah, I'm an equal opportunity. Yes, offender. you're bi you're a bipartisan cartoonist. No, an equal opportunity offender uh, is yes. what I was trying to do. Um, the um, the uh, here's here here's here's the Nasasi thing. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can see it, the, the drawing of my, on there. And he, uh, yeah. I was, I got it. What was so incredible was that you can see I'm right down there at courtside. Look at yeah. this. Is that I you? Mean, he was more. Well, I'm, 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 this is, this is either the Sassy or, or Tanner. I forgot which. And it was at night also. I don't know how the hell I did this, but it was really so. Uh, and I think this ran on, uh, this was on CBS uh, when I did that, but it's all on the back. Anyway, it's, it's incredible. Um, I covered the Democratic Convention for um, Saturday Review and uh, uh, Cavalier Magazine. They did pages, and it's the same thing. It's also in here. And just again, it was the idea that combining a lot of things that I had loved to do, because one of the things that you know, before I was really full-time cartooning, I was a newspaper reporter as well uh, for a hometown news service. And of course, with the you know, journalistic things that I had from the army and stuff, uh, you know, I was good at going around interviewing people, making notes and stuff. Uh, and then of course, the, the quick sketches, which I always loved to do, uh, was the visual part. And so the reportage was really a great, great combination and opportunity to do multi-page reports or reportage of, of them. Um, and that really all came out, I guess, from the single panel stuff, like the Saturday Review. I mean, it was, it was edited by Norman Cousins. He knew my work very well. I said, Norman, we've got this 68, this convention going on in Chicago. Uh, send me out there, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple pages. He said, fine, it was just, it was easy at that point. You knew people and then you could just get assignments like that so i did that i sketched for days uh, got beat up and uh we tried to get into the hilton hotel after the protests and tear gas and uh i guess one of my so-called uh, uh fonder memories and it's kind of strange to say fonder is trying to get back to the hotel with uh, neil hickey who was from uh, tv guide who i was rooming with to get into the, the hotel and you could smell and breathe the tear gas and was, the hotel was surrounded by these cops on horseback. And I started to go in and uh, they said, no, you can't go in, can't go in there. And I said, yeah, I, I, that's first of all, I have a room there. And secondly, you know, and I was holding up my press credentials, <laughs> stupid <laughs> press credentials, this is here. And he reared up a horse and the horse knocked me down. So I got trampled by a horse, if you will, uh, in, in, in that sense and, 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 had, the, and had the spread. The, uh, I was very, very pleased about that. Paul Krasner was with me, uh, uh, a number of other great people, even Felix, Felix Topolsky I met, who was one of the greatest sketch artists in the world, world, world famous. You can check out, out his name. I was embarrassing myself by saying, hey, I'm out here doing drawings. The Nixon thing was an outgrowth of uh, the stint I had uh, doing regular uh, daily uh, cartoons for News Center 4, Channel 4 in New York, uh, which was a whole longer story of getting there, but uh, they were promoting me as uh, somebody who was doing political <clears throat> type cartoons and was covering the Nixon, uh, um, uh, uh, well, it was gonna be the election night that was coming up. And they said, well, was gonna... that Nixon McGovern or was that Nixon? The second, the second one. Uh, yeah, uh, that was McGovern then. 
So he uh, was going uh, to, to put me on uh, and to promote the idea that I was going to be doing this coverage. They said, well, you have to go on, uh, well, you have to put this on um, uh, Barbara Walters, the Today Show. And I thought, oh my God, it's Today Show. Uh, <laughs> and to be interviewed by Barbara That's Walters. It's awfully early to get up. I mean, it was, well, she was known as a really bar barracuda type person. She was going <laughs> to slaughter you and get out. On. And this is now live television to promote this, you know, this whole thing. Uh, which they set up in the big thing. The, uh, Lee Hanna was the news director at Channel 4. He said, go see uh, Schulberg, who was the, uh, he was the executive producer. I remember going in, sitting uh, in front of his desk and uh, telling him that I was going to be doing this coverage uh, for a political thing. And it was one of these things that you read of the moment. He said, oh, that sounds good. Well, we'll put you on with Barbara. And he turns around and behind him on the wall is this, this huge um, schedule, you know, with the calendar. And, and uh, election day, election day morning, he writes in, it was like Tuesday, the whatever. And he just writes in, Mort Gerberg. <laughs> so I was just slotted in there with Barbara Walters. And of course, I got up at four o'clock. I was nervous as hell and everything else. And what the bit was is that I was found, you know, you, you, the, the camera finds you at this huge drawing board, you know, a gigantic drawing board. And I'm doing a cartoon. I'm drawing a cartoon on the spot, which, of course, I had, you know, done before. Uh, so I knew what it was and knew what the cartoon was going to be. And what the 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 programming was supposed to be a show of not only me coming on to be a political cartoonist, but I had a new collection of cartoons, a paperback, one of these small slick covered paperbacks, regular, you know, slick. And Barbara was reading the captions and going through the cartoons as she was looking at, it, reading the captions that flashed on the screen. And she finishes doing this. She's sitting at the top of the drawing board, you know, where it's, it comes sliding down so on the top. And she's leaning on the top of the board. And she puts, while she's talking, she's leaning, uh, she places the, uh, uh, the little book, the paperback on the top and keeps talking. But because it's slick, it slides. It slides down to where I am at the bottom, I'm drawing. And she's continued to talk. She grabs the book again. And, and says more, and she puts it back on the top again. And again, it slowly slides down at the top again. And just uh, like a third time, now she's getting a look, I can see she's a little nudgy, and I'm doing things. And uh, she pipes it up, and it starts to slide down again for the third time. And she's now really exasperated. She's, oh, I said, she's, what am I going to do with this book? And I said, well, you could buy it, Barbara. You could buy it. Good one. They went nuts. The people, the people on, on the, the stage hands just roared. I mean, they were around because, as I said, she was known as a, as a kind of a tough ass or something like that. But it turned out very well. Uh, the piece, as it were, went on. I was on for something like, with all the cutting back and forth, I could have been on 10 minutes. I mean, it was unheard of. I walked off the stage and Schulberg, who was the producer, the executive producer, he says, that was terrific. And we just got a call from Washington. They want you to do the, the coverage of Nixon's inauguration. And so I went back there in January to Washington, D.C., where they had built up this whole thing. And Edwin Newman was the, uh, the big commentator, and along with a political commentator from Britain named uh, Robin Cook, uh, with a kind of a three-way hookup uh, to have me which I, they had built this whole stand for me in front of the Capitol you know, building where the inauguration swearing in was taking place. And Robin and Edwin are back in New York City. And so there's cameras here and there's cameras here. And I'm, I'm figuring which one am I supposed to look at where? It gets a little, a little tricky. And we're getting close to airtime. This is live also, this is all going on. And I'm, I'm wearing my raincoat because it's starting to rain a little bit. And suddenly I look around at this starting a countdown. It's about three minutes before airtime. And I'm looking around after all of this fussing and I'm saying, all right, I gotta sit down. And Edmund is saying, all right, more, go I'll sit down and get yourself in front of the camera. And I said, all right, 
where's the chair? <laughs> they had this whole thing built on this platform or something. And I, they don't have a chair, you know, <laughs> I'm saying, what am I supposed to sit on here? And looking around, it was ridiculous. And finally in the corner uh, of the stand, I see a, a plastic garbage can. And there's no other time for anything else. I take the garbage can and I turn it upside down and I sat on the garbage can and I conducted this interview while I was drawing the cartoons and talking to them over them. So uh, no, no, nobody. Well, hey, more. what were you drawing with? What was I drawing? Oh, yeah, I, was, I mean, was it like a marker, a flipboard? Oh, what I was drawing with. Oh yeah, big black markers, yeah. But they and you they, can just do that extemporaneously. No, 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 no. I had submitted uh, a bunch of ideas. Some were kind of nasty, also. I mean, I was <laughs> I wasn't really. You went nasty on Nixon. I wasn't nasty. Yeah, I was nasty on Nixon, and uh, <laughs> actually, it had to do with him uh, trying. One of them was really something. He was uh, in a in front of a mirror uh, with uh, his wife. I forgot his wife's name. Trisha. No, that was his daughter. No, uh, Mrs. Pat. Nixon. Mrs. Pat, wasn't it? Pat, yes. Anyway, they're standing in front of a mirror and he's he's putting his clothes on and he's drawing on a crown, you know, <laughs> like a king, you know, that's this kind of a thing. And and Robin Cook made the op observation back in New York with Edwin Newman. Uh, she, he said, Morse, she says, that's not exactly a crown that she's got there, if that's appropriate. He was looking at the details. I didn't know. What I, <laughs> I said, it's a, it's a crown, damn it. You, know, you, turned, it's, you turned Nixon into a queen. Sorry. Well, that's cute. But um, anyway, there was, the, there was the glory and the glamour of, of being on uh, NBC uh, live coverage of Nixon sitting on a garbage can. <laughs> Nobody would ever know. Uh, but all of that was a uh, uh, growth out. Then I started doing the, the live, the live, uh, the live drawing cartoons while talking. That was my cartoon views of the news that I did uh, every week on uh, a news center for, uh, and it was one and one and a half minutes. Uh, wow. that, that could I, be an eternity. Well, <laughs> I had I had to rehearse it a lot, and I know. It was when my daughter, it was 40, 46 years ago when I started at 45, maybe she was about a year old and uh, Judith was nursing her and uh, Judith had to sit uh, with, a, with a stopwatch and time me. And I had to do these things to rehearse the night before, maybe 20 times so that I knew at a certain point in a drawing, my spiel, you know, I would have to be at a certain sure. point of spiel to re rehearse these things. So we would do it again and again and again until I you know, was able to get it. And I would be taking uh, topics of the day. Uh, it was like one of Ed Koch's had an apartment down in New York in, uh, in Greenwich Village uh, while he was mayor. So should he keep the apartment and, and all of that? I mean, was, there were, you know, issues of the moment of politics and what have you. But the, the trick of it was that there was um, the idea that I had made up this thing that while talking, it was like, you know, rubbing your head behind that whole thing. Two things at the same time that were quite, quite diverse. And it was, uh, uh, that was, an, I got kind of a couple of those in the exhibition also at, at, the, uh, at the center too. Uh, I had a lot of fun with that also. One of the other anchors besides Tony Guider, who became a very good friend, uh, and who would always introduce me, you know, uh, this is, you know, now it's time for a cartoon by Mort Gerberg. And once in a while, uh, the other guy there, Chuck Scarborough, great big, tall, blonde, beautiful looking guy, but I didn't think he was too quick, you know. You know <laughs> and what had happened was that after a while, the producers of the show were getting nervous that I was doing this live, you know, and they said, you can't do it live. I said, well, I've been practicing it and I'm doing it live. They said, no, you're going to have to pre-tape these. I said, well, all right, doesn't matter. You can't really tell. So I was now doing pre-taping. A lot of the things that they did were pre-taped to make sure that they were accurate. Uh, and so one afternoon of doing this, there was Chuck Scarborough, you know, when he was, he was there and he was waiting his next. I was going to taping my thing. And then, you know, I came off the set and there was Chuck standing there. Uh, again, this great, big, beautiful, somewhat, I thought, slow. And uh, Chuck comes up and he says, Mort, that was just so terrific. You, 
you were really, really wonderful. I mean, you're drawing and everything is so great. I, I, I wish I could do that. And I, I said, oh, well, that's nice of you to think that, Chuck, but you, you couldn't. So I started to walk away. And went, wait, 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 wait. He said, what do you mean? What do you mean I, I couldn't? He says, no, it's, let it go. It's okay, Chuck. You, you, you couldn't do it. And I'm walking away again. Now he's really <laughs> getting crazy. He says, well, what do you mean I can't do it? I said, you can't. Let's, uh, I don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm going to walk. I have to. He grabs my arm. He says, no, you have to tell me. Why Why couldn't I do that? And I looked up at him and took a breath. And I said, because, Chuck, you're too tall. <laughs> <laughs> they broke up. They went nuts. I mean, <laughs> Tony always loved that. <laughs> uh, anyway, these are... Uh, the things that I find amusing and remember, Tony remembers a, a lot of fooling around like that. He, he would always have, <clears throat> as I said, he would introdu introduce me. I mean, not as eloquently as my friend, uh, Mr. Eckstein over here just did well, earlier. Uh, but Tony would introduce the cartoon. He said, and now if it's Tuesday, we have, we have a, Nice cartoon by Mort Gerber. And I was on the screen. I was watching this, you know, I was home. Uh, I said, nice. And yeah, I go Mort, have you ever done a nice cartoon? That's <laughs> the point. I said, I go into his office and I wrote a note. I said, Tony, a cartoon can be acerbic. It can be nasty. It can be sarcastic. It can be wicked. It can be devastating. It can be crappy. And I had about 19 of these uh, adjectives and I left on his desk. And the next time he comes up and I see there's Tony on the screen and he says, and now if it's Tuesday, we have an acerbic, disgusting, <laughs> nice. <laughs> he read the whole list. Of Did he ever adjectives. say funny? A cartoon. Oh, of course, that too. But uh, these are the uh, the other little stories I remember. And so I was. Uh, Tony now has a a thing called Tony Guiders New York. Uh, it's really wonderful. It's on uh, CUNY, C U N C U N. You you know it. Yeah. And it's it's it, he you know is interviewing all the great people from New York around New York City. And uh, I think I was the second or third one of them. And I've done it several of them at some points. And uh, when I got on to do the first taping, I, I said uh, something like that. Are you going to make sure that this is an acerbic, nasty, sarcastic? But so we play it back and forth. A lot of different things. Uh, and you see, I guess we've not been talking a lot about single panel cartoons, which is, you know. Probably. So Amor, did you, did you have any single panel cartoonists that you looked at when you were growing up? I mean, were you exposed to that or did you just discover it? Well, I think as I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the first time I really was looking at single panel cartoonists was uh, in Mexico. I know it sounds so, so, uh, I said un, unsophisticated, but I just never had looked at the New Yorker. But it wasn't until then that I started looking at at the who, who did you look at? Who attracted you first? Well, as I think I said, uh, each each of them had really great styles. Lee, of course, is across the board. And uh, when I did, I did this book. This is the book, of course, that that Bob talks about. Right. Uh, that has the best best cartoons in there. And I picked out stuff from Lee, for example, that that um, that one about um, the prehistoric days. Uh, it's just, just a classic, classically great cartoon. Uh, Evolution has been good to you, Sid. You know, check it out. It's, it's the first, first one. So Lee Lorenz, uh, certainly the magnificence of Chuck Saxon, those drawings are, are there. See, the, you kind of remind me of uh, Thurber because he would just start drawing and whatever happened became the cartoon. And it sounds like you just started drawing and what happened became the cartoon, but you had more of an idea what was going to happen at the end than Thurber did. Uh, well, Thurber really was the writer. That's, that's, that's the point. And, and that's, uh, I think it turned around the other way. He was doing these cartoons, 
but the captions were so inordinately long that they finally, you know, make sure that he was doing, you know, a lot more writing than uh, than, than cartooning. Uh, I think that my attraction uh, had different things. Frank Modell, I thought, was it just so superior uh, expressions, and and he was somebody who drew uh, a lot of spontaneity. Stevenson was one of the most incredible uh, of all. These these guys knew how to put a picture together that told the story in in six seconds which is what a cartoon is. You have to get that real fast. I have a, yeah, it reminds me, your first cartoon just looks like an arch, archetypal New Yorker cartoon, but it doesn't look like one of your cartoons. But your later ones are which the ones one? that I think of when I think of your cartoons, which are much more simplistic and uh, quick and fresh looking. Oh, yes. The earliest ones I did were very labored. Uh, and that actually well, was something I, I didn't know how to do cartoons. And I took, I did take a class when I got out of the army. I thought I had the GI Bill. I thought I was going to learn something. And I, I took a quick class at uh, a cartoonist and illustrator school. Um, uh, now it's called Visual, School of Visual Arts. And there was a guy named Charlie Strauss who was doing single panel cartoons. The other class I took was with Jerry Robinson. Uh, who, of course, uh, you know, was doing uh, Batman and, and, and like that. Uh, Jerry actually wanted me to do comic strips. Uh, he said I was really, really good at it. Maybe I was. I, I, did, I did do a comic strip. I did several comic strips, actually. But to go back to Charlie Strauss, he said the way that you do single panel cartoons, this is the way you do it. First, you sketch it in blue, you know, with a nice blue pencil. <laughs> And then uh, what you can do is uh, you can put a piece of tracing paper over a light box and then you trace the drawing in blue so you have a nice clean line. Then you take a number two sable, red sable tip brush and you stick it in the ink and you wipe it <laughs> off and you get a nice point. And then you go like this, you know, like that. Yeah. Uh, so like Bob, that. you need to get him a quibs nib. That would have helped. This is the brush, you know. And so I was doing cartoons that looked like that. And those were the cartoons that I started taking around. That sounds you know? horrible. And I wasn't getting any, but what did I know? This is what Charlie Strauss was saying. That's what you do for cartoons. And he had a guest, uh, John Gallagher, who was really a great Saturday Evening Post cartoonist early, early on. And Gallagher was saying, yes, that's true. And that's the way they all did it. Erwin Kaplan, go back to the, the late 50s in the Saturday evening post, they all drew like that. That's what it looked like. And, and it was thought, all brushwork. Well, yeah. And, and also the repetition of doing the sketches. And then you go over it. So it was very, very work this way. And so I didn't know any better. And that's what I did. And so one day I was at, and I wasn't getting too many OKs or any, any kind of response. And I was at maybe it may have been like a thousand jokes. They paid five dollars, I think, or four dollars for a cartoon, and uh, I wasn't getting anywhere. And I started to put my stuff back in the bag that I had, and it was open. And the uh, editor, uh, Jack, somebody, looked in and he said, "What? What are those? What are those sketches you got in the in the in the bag there? What are those?" And I said, "Oh, these are just my my roughs and things." He said, "Let me see those." And he takes these drawings, and of course, those are my, my first, you know, like this drawing. He said, "These are terrific. This is I loved what this looks like." And that's when that first got the turnaround that I should be simply drawing. Yeah, those are the cartoons that I think of you, the very loose, fresh, immediate kind of drawing. Well, it would brush a lot of pen, pen, fountain pen, and, and stuff like that. It was also easier when I went out uh, on the sketching. I remember doing a ski assignment. It was called the Stowe Cups. I went up to Stowe, Vermont. It was like 10 below zero. And I was doing, they had these races and I was doing this for skiing magazine. And I plastered myself on the side of the hill. And the challenge was that it was so cold that the ink was freezing up. <laughs> I had to go back the next day and I figured out a way I put alcohol in the ink so it wouldn't freeze the ink so much. Yeah, don't put it in you. <laughs> yeah, not in the ears at all. Um, anyway, uh, that's, you know, the drawings uh, 
thank you for for that that kind of a notice the the idea of the energy of the drawing yeah they uh, really opened up i noticed as i looked through your work where you use the white space as both the front of the drawing and the back of the drawing and that's that's what i find very impressive about your work what do you mean the front and the back well like you would you would draw something but just like your noah ark this is a little technical but your noah ark cartoon is just a a line that creates the the arc but it's also the background and it's also the ground because that's the only line so the, it creates a lot of space there with just a very simple line that noah's ark cartoon uh that ran in the new yorker just a couple of years ago i think uh that's oh that's... you also you also have the longest uh space between drawing your first rough and getting it published. Wasn't it like 17 years and you found it and it was a Noah's Ark cartoon? That, that might've been it. That might've been it. I had, I had gone through, which is what I'm doing now a lot of. I mean, the fact of the matter is that I'm having uh, a little bit more trouble drawing as I, I used to, my eye gets tired and blah, 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 and maybe whatever. And so I am going through old drawings and I had, Yes, I think I came across the energy. That's right. I came across the energy of that drawing. And I thought, my God, I never sold this thing. This is really terrific. And I resubmitted it to, uh, and Remnick bought it, you know, for the same reason. And they sent it back. They said, do a finish. And I looked at it and I said, there's no way I can do anything better than what this mm -hmm. is. I cleaned it up a little bit. I did make a, um, a scan of it. And, uh, and and brought it up to to speed. I think the DPI was a little was too low also, and I did something with it. But yes, absolutely, I did not. That was probably it. A long a long time in between uh, the first time I looked at it and something else. Uh, you make that a regular habit because you had another cartoon that you did for many years ago, and it appeared in the New Yorker recently, and it was a cartoon with a subway map. You remember you doing a, a subway map cartoon in the daily cartoon? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've done a couple of variations on yeah, that. Too. But that was a case of a lot of time passing because I remember us discussing that one, one time over lunch at the Pergolas. And you had that cartoon was years and years old and it resurfaced recently. Well, <clears throat> what there a lot, and I, I was kind of moved. I hadn't really noticed it a lot, but when I was reading a lot of the reports and the reviews uh, about the show at the Historical Society, one of the things that they kept uh, in, uh, uh, repeating was that the work that I had done 50 years ago uh, seemed just as viable, or some of it, as it would be today. And a lot of it, uh, you know, the same kind of cliches or usages or something else, uh, aside from the drawings themselves were, uh, you know, always going to be that way. So I think it's, there's nothing wrong with using Google. I have, it reminds me of another story though. It's really, really quick. Um, and again, uh, it's taking use of some of my favorite subjects and using them. So I bring a, a bunch of, of cartoons into Lee and uh, he, he holds, you know, a bunch and he says, fine. And then I get an okay on, on, on the drawing. And uh, the drawing is a guy standing, uh, a skier, and he's standing on the top of a mountain, ready to go down the mountain. And you know, the little, the trail mark signs on top of the uh, uh, mountain, and it tells you the name of the, of the trail you're going to, whether it's, uh, uh, a blue or a green or whatever. And it's got different names to the mountains, to, to the trails, like downhill or uh, uh, Excalibur or uh, Jaws of Death or whatever these names are. So the cartoon shows the guy standing on top and there's about six different signs and they're all pointing in different ways and they all say down, down, <laughs> down, down, oh. down. That's the whole thing. Okay, so I... I get you know, the drawing and I uh, bring it in. And the practice has always been at the New Yorker, there was this little uh, evaluation time, you know, that they have to check out 
whether or not it's been done before or whether or not it could be used before. At least it was in the old days. I don't know what they're doing so well these days. Anyway, in this case, I turned in the drawing and uh, I'm you know, going on to the next thing. In the middle of the week, I get a phone call from Lee. He says, Mort, uh, about that ski cartoon. I said, yeah. He says, uh, we, we, can't, we can't buy it. I said, what do you mean you can't buy it? Why can't you buy it? He says, because it's already been done. I said, oh, shit. I'm sorry, it's not in. Who did it? He said, you did. You did. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. So <laughs> He can still pay you. I don't think that they were very, very generous that way, but that was really very <laughs> odd. Because again, you play things like, I'm sure you've had that. Bob, haven't you done it before? You come up across a drawing that you've done, or, or Michael, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. And you forget. I, you forget I, I use a lot of your it. ideas. <laughs> It'd be nice if they bought the, the same one twice. That would be good. Yeah. See, and, I got, and I got to tell you, the, the caveman playing ping pong, that was one of my favorite cartoons. I, uh, I was trying to come up with something similar, and I had them playing air hockey. But you did it first, and uh, your, yours was one of my favorite cartoons when I saw it. Well, it's so odd. Thank you. Thank you. But it's so odd that you can come up with things that sometimes are really impossible. And here's another situation. I came in with my batch, uh, showing Lee. <clears throat> it's almost like a reverse of what the story I just told. Uh, I'm showing him my batch, and you know, he goes through them. He would always have a certain pile, there's always a thing you didn't know which, which was the pile he was going to hold and which is the pile he was going to uh, reject. <laughs> so I had one, I had one particular cartoon I had gotten, I said, I don't know where this idea came. This is so, so wild. It's just really so. And the cartoon had to do with, you know, a, 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 a satyr, you know, the half man, half horse idea. Okay. And um, I think it was, two of the satyrs are looking at another one. But the third one is not a half man, half horse. It's a half man, half motorcycle. Okay. Ah. So this is the image on it. And they were saying something, I forget what it was. So Lee is going through this. He comes to the drawing and he holds it up and he looks at it. He says, this is really, really something. I said, yeah, isn't it terrific? He said, yeah, but uh, it's been done. I said, it's been done. Nobody could do this. How could I even think of that? Who, who could do that before? It's like an idea that nobody else could possibly have thought of in, in possibly like, who could have done that? He said, I have. he's a new cartoonist. His name oh. is Arnie Levin. <laughs> oh, you know, Arnie. it's also a Geico commercial now. Yeah, it took, it, they stole the idea, Mort. Well, come on. What, what are, you, so, are you serious? No, yeah, there's a Geico commercial right now with a, a motorcycle with a man's torso, and he's gassing up. Because you can save by bundling your uh, motorcycle with your car I wonder, insurance. I wonder if, well, Arnie, you know, my cartoon was obviously not accepted, but Arnie's was, and Arnie's is in, was in the magazine. Was and let's, let's explain it. Arnie is a huge motorcyclist who's fully tattooed, who's, who I love. And he's a, a good friend and I miss him. And um, he does some of the most wonderful cartoons. Brilliant, brilliant, yeah, really. Brilliant, brilliant, Bob, brilliant. Bob, I understand he also has Geico motorcycle insurance. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, we've come full circle. Full circle, yeah. You, can, you, 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 sell, you sell them all. But you see there again, it's an idea you think nobody could ever think of. Uh, and I, I could not believe it. And then of course I had never... I had never met Arnie Levin. He had just, you know, sold the first cartoon or two to the to the uh, to the magazine. So uh, it's it, it's all of these things. Uh, now, of course, I have uh, I have little compunctions about resubmitting things. Uh, particularly, it was hard in this whole last couple of years with. Uh, uh, I don't want to mention his name. He who shall never be mentioned again. Uh, in the political field and circles. Uh, it, it kept necessitating my, my uh, going back again and saying it again. Didn't you, like, like saying to the audiences out there, didn't you hear what I did? Didn't you see this before? <laughs> Would you get this? 
anyway, it's hard to do that uh, hard thing, political stuff. Um, anyway, these are the, uh, the thoughts of different magazines, different times. Uh, I'm just suddenly thinking in the ideas of people who were doing um, cartoons and how editors would change them. Uh, Playboy was always a very interesting thing too. And uh, my, it, my reactions with Hefner and with uh, uh, Michelle Yuri and uh, Michelle was a wonderful, uh, wonderful person. Uh, and also, you know, she was carrying the, the Playboy uh, uh, motif or idea or atmosphere full strength. Uh, most of the time they, they never made any comments about when I did these finishes especially when I started to do the girly stuff uh, in full color. Uh, but there was just one that, <laughs> and uh, Michelle being so uh, forthright and uh, direct in her comments, you know, um, I had sent in a sexy drawing. I, I can't remember really what the situation was, but it was very sexy. And uh, I had pulled out my best stops and doing really beautiful women who look extremely great with or without clothes. In this place, I think there was a lot of clothes missing. And uh, she sent back the drawing and uh, she said, well, thank you very, very much, but uh, this has to be redone. This is not good because the girl's tits are too pointy. <laughs> which I thought was, you know, the ultimate <laughs> of it you, all. You never got those notes from Lee? <laughs> you know, Lee Lorenz could draw a Rubenesque female. He was wonderful. He is. Mark, you taught me something at Playboy because being uh, raised very Catholic and religious. I'm saying, I, say, say, say again, I'm sorry. You taught me something at Playboy because I, I grew up religious and Catholic, and I felt uh, ashamed to do those type of drawings for Playboy. But you were one of the few cartoonists at that magazine that didn't always run dirty magazine cartoons. You, I remember one in particular where there's a couple out in the balcony looking out in the sky. And instead of a moon, it's a golf ball. And she's, she's asking him what his thoughts are. And, and from that, it taught me that I didn't have to go that route. And I sold uh, to Playboy all these cartoons that were all rated G. Well, it was a sort of a reverse thing for me. When I first started submitting to Playboy, uh, it was sort of a, across the, the board. They were really largely... Uh, rejects from uh, the New York. Well, no, I wasn't selling the New Yorker then. But maybe it was after, maybe I was, I forget what the time frame was. Uh, but, the, and the point was that, that Hefner was buying uh, them. When I first, my first couple of sales, he was buying these black and white sketches that was quote unquote, sort of social comment. And <clears throat> when I tried to send in ideas about the girls or the relationship things, he said he wanted to keep me in the back of the book doing back of the book, the, the, the black and white small cartoons uh, that were about social issues and everything that were not the girly stuff. So mm -hmm. in other words, he was not including like, the girly stuff. And then I suddenly realized, however, that you know that you know Gay and Wilson and, and and all these people are making you know eight times as much for their full for their color drawings that I was making for my uh, black and white drawings. So I wrote to Michelle. I said, "Listen, uh, I I just like to do T and A just as much as the next guy. <laughs> you know, let me let me you know have this." She said, "No, you can't do it." I said, "Let me try a color thing and you know see how it how it goes." And uh, she said, well, all right, you know, and I sent in some color roughs and he started to buy them. And then uh, in the latter part of that thing, it just switched around. I tried to make them a, a little, you know, 
more intelligent than simply plain old TNA. And like the idea that you just mentioned, I remember it very well. It was a favorite of mine. Of a, a penny for your thoughts was the caption. And uh, he's looking yeah. at a golf ball and she's, you know, very sexy in that, well, you know, that way. So it was a little bit, a little bit more of that, but, uh, you know, there was always a certain kind of thing. Sam, Sam Gross, of course, never has any compunctions about doing anything else. <laughs> I mean, his classic story of the dog going up to heaven and asking St. Patrick if he can have his testicles back. <laughs> was, yeah, I don't uh, think Sam Gross could draw a an attractive female that I no, can no, remember. No, no. no, that's that's not his thing. <laughs> it was his mind was going in other directions. Well, it's it's a whole thing, but it, it sort of reminds me. It goes back to a, a story I wanted to tell about uh, City College um, that I had gone really thinking that I wanted to do some cartoons at uh, high school. And I think you said that you'd, uh, uh, Michael, you said some, some old drawings, which were maybe in the exhibition or someplace else. And that's what my drawings were looking like in high school. But when I go out in there, I wanted to do a comic strip, which I thought that would be a thing. And I opened up the newspaper, the Lafayette News. The Lafayette High school was was really a, a finishing school for the mafia kids who would grow up to be mafia. <laughs> so I mean, it was a really great school in Coney Island that you could you know sink in the snake. But I opened up the newspaper and there was this incredibly drawn comic strip. It was just absolutely beautiful. I couldn't believe that somebody, how old was I then, fourteen or something like that? I don't know, uh, could draw so well, and I was so inhibited and so. So, you know, really daunted. Uh, I never, you know, looked to find out who it was who was doing this comic strip. And it was only years later that I discovered through my uh, friendship with, with Bob Blackman, who knew him, this person that I'm about to mention. And in our conversation, I learned that the person who had been doing that comic strip at Lafayette High School, and was keeping me out was Maurice Sendak at Lafayette High School. So I mean, I sort of find this out. So well, at now, least he never at least he never went on to cartooning. So there you go. Exactly. So flash forward, I go now to enter uh, City College uh, downtown, and I go right to the newspaper office, and I, I meet the editor there, whose name is uh, Ralph Ginsburg, Wendy Ginsburg, who uh, was a uh, somebody in the news, a journalist and uh, a censorship. Anyway, he loved the cartoons. He said, right away, we're gonna do you a lot. And so I did cartoons every, every week. Uh, uh, they were called City Snickers. Uh, and uh, it was the name of the panel. And I did it every, every, every year. I never did, didn't, didn't miss once. And I, I didn't even remember that I had missed one week until, again, flash forward another 30 years, maybe, or 20, whatever it was, and I'm talking with a cartoonist who is, you know, somebody who I got to be really friendly with, got to be a really successful cartoonist, who remembered me as being the cartoonist for the ticker, the City College paper. And the cartoonist said, <clears throat> you know, I was there, and I was really pissed at you because you never ever let me even get in there. I said, I didn't even know you went to the school. He <laughs> said, yeah, I was at the school. And uh, you were always there, you never missed a week. You missed one week. And I was able to get my cartoon in there. Uh, but then you son of a bitch, you came back and you kept doing it until we, we graduated. I said, well, why don't you come and say hello? I didn't even know you were there or anything else until today. He said, well, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. And now you want me to tell me, tell you the name of that cartoonist? <laughs> Sam Gross. Why? Oh, get okay. out. Now, where does Jules Pfeiffer fit in the neighborhood? Well, Jules grew up in the Bronx, though, uh, with Ed Sorrell. Okay. So they you were... got, I mean, it's like that area was a hotbed for cartooning talent that no one quite appreciates. Which area, you mean? I mean, like Brooklyn and that. Yeah, Bensonhurst, which is close to Midwood, where Neil Simon 
and Woody Allen and other people grew up. There, well, there's yeah. a lot of history of comedy in central Brooklyn. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. I mean, it's just like, you know, all over the place. Barbara Streisand was, went to Brooklyn College with my sister. So, I mean, it's, you know, uh, that's, that's, you know, the, but I, I love the idea of the crossovers with, uh, with you know, those uh, the people who were, who were there. But, you know, you could go back and, and talk about, you know, our, our, our latest, you know, great hero, Al Jaffe, who just turned 100 years old. Uh, and, and he had been pulled out, I think, I think it was Tilden, and he was in school with Harvey Kurtzman. And um, um, uh, who's the other, oh God, the other artist, the cartoonist, uh, uh, Will Elder, that uh, uh, he, uh, Al and, uh, and Will were together, and they were pulled out of their high schools to uh, go to the first, uh, the first uh, congregation at music and art high school. And the big joke around here is that I'm always, I never even knew that music and art high school exists because I was being in the dumb mafia school at Lafayette. They thought it was pretty good there. And I'm always making jokes to Judith saying, see, if I had, if I had known music and art high school existed, I might've gone to music and art high school and made something of myself. You might've made something of yourself instead of like yeah. on this podcast. I There's mean, still time. Hard. There's still time. Yes. I mean, it's uh, so many people okay. did, did do that, but Judith keeps saying, yeah, you, you know, you did what you did. We're going to introduce you to Marty. He can, he can set you up with some cartoons. <laughs> well, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know where it comes from, except from just sort of doing what you think. And so many people, I mean, some people did very, very well with going to school like that. I think uh, uh, Bob Blackman was uh, one. I think, uh, I think that's, well, a lot of people I know, but I don't think Jules never went to art school. I never went to art school. I don't even think Sorrell, maybe Sorrell did. Sorrell is, again, out of this world. He's just unbelievable. And... Uh, they're still going strong. Wonderful. I mean, there's another one. I remember seeing you talk about the, the techniques of drawing when I was taught by Charlie Strauss to do this pencil line like this, uh, Michael, you know, uh -huh. this, this whole thing. And then I remember being uh, visiting uh, uh, Ed uh, Sorrell when he was, um, I think I was interviewing him for the book at some point and he was in a corner and he was, he was working on his drawing and this huge and he's got this gigantic drawing board with these huge pieces of paper and he was you know from the armpit draw oh, really he's like a, a abstract expressionist and then then he would take a, a very very light uh, a bond paper maybe like a two ply or something and he would put it over there but unlike saxon who would be doing with his carbon pencils you know this kind of thing doing it not really tight but still in off he would follow it but ed was doing he's drawing oh. with his pen and ink all over the place just uh, just amazing just amazing stuff uh, these are these are my heroes these are absolutely you know the, the best that's why it kind of yutzes me a, a, a little bit you understand yutzes no you had a you had another word that i was interested in i don't uh, let me let me find it it was Pretty fascinating. Uh, blesh. Blesh comes from a Theodore Sturgeon. Uh, Theodore Sturgeon is one of the great, great uh, science fiction writers, fantasy fiction writers. And it was uh, which one of the two two novels uh, that I absolutely loved. Uh, one was The Dreaming Jewels and uh, the other one was the one where I found the word blesh. Where did you find it? It's, 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 I, I listened to your uh, broadcast on, uh, what was it, Curators Confidential. Yeah, with Marilyn. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and you, you brought blesh, but didn't really talk about it. I, I found that interesting, a term. It's a word that is from Theodore Sturgeon. I uh, found it in a novel. It's obviously a combination of two words, blend and mesh. Okay, and, and <laughs> the it's a marvelous book. Oh God, well, I can't remember the title of it. No, that's up, all right. Look up Thur Theodore Sturgeon. And I will. One of his novels, uh, more than human, more than human. Okay, more than human, 
and it talks about a composite being, and there oh. are many different parts of it. It's impossible to describe. Beautifully written, beautifully imagined, everything else, and it concerns this: the when a fingers a people come together and bless. Yes, Bob and I usually just come up with meh. <laughs> well, uh, buh. Yeah. <laughs> it's not so bad either. What's up, bro? Yeah, no. Anyway. More, we can't keep you here forever, but I can't let you go without saying maybe a word about your movie appearance and say it again. get closer to the microphone. Remember, I'm hard of hearing. I said before you go, there's one thing I want to ask you about your movie appearance in very semi serious. What about it? Well, if you have a word about it. You were the star. We we were just uh, observing. I was, I was the it. star? If you said that, it, are you... Well, that, that's not you are, you, uh, uh, Mort, you are our hero. You are yeah, the anti... You are, you are the... Uh, um, oh, who, who, is the, who is the classic anti-hero in the movies? Uh, the, the what? The who anti-hero. Is? You are the grist. Well, E.G. Robinson? No. Um, never mind. I'll think of it. I'll think of it later. I'll yeah, more, we, more, well, we put you on top of the bill. Well, well, let me just let me just say that uh, it's maybe it sort of uh, answers some unasked questions or, or surmises on my part. You are the Montgomery when, Cliff. When, How's that? All right. When. I was invited down for the preview down at the film festival down in the you know uh, lower Manhattan. There, it's a big pre. What was going on? And there was a lot of photography. People were taking pictures. Yes, I was there. I was invited there. I, I didn't know particularly you know why I was going to be there because there was one person who I thought totally dominated the entire scene, uh, not only of the movie but of the cartooning world indeed of the whole entire world itself. And you know who I'm talking about. I mean, there was just no way of getting around, particularly when connected with the New Yorker magazine and cartooning and the editor or something else. You mean and Bob so, Eckstein? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay, good. I was cut. I was got, cut. <laughs> wait, wait, you got, you, got, you got the Bob part cut, uh, right? Anyway, I came walking in and there were a lot of photographers all around. And uh, Mr. M came over to me and he said, uh, I think, you know, with a kind of a smirky with his face, he said, uh, well, it's, it's going to be nice. I, I've seen it. I think you're going to be very pleased with it. And he was sort of gritting his teeth a little bit, something I, I thought. I mean, I, I, clearly he was, you know, the overwhelming, you know, starring presence of the movie. I enjoyed the little um, side things in the movie. Uh, the things that I remember that... Uh, Bob, what was her name? The, the lane, Linda Lida? No. No, yeah, we'll look it up. Um, yeah, in any way, in any way, she she had a, a sense, and she filmed a lovely uh, one one lovely shot. I remember we went down to visit my locker uh, in Lower Manhattan, where I have kept all of this stuff. I hadn't been there for a while. Uh, we were talking about some old things, and I went into the locker, and I I found this drawing that I had put away down there and that's the that's the uh the first drawing that i ever sold right that was your cathedral drawing exactly Exactly. i remember that that's the part i remember and then i saw it again it was like uh storage wars i go i I wish i found that locker well it's still it's still there but what i got was and i was so moved when i was she kept the shot in that when she opened the door or i opened the door and i I pulled the drawing out and I hadn't seen it in a while. And I, it truly was at the moment and I was unwrapping it and I, got, and I picked it up and I looked at it and there was this expression on my face, which the, the camera had caught. I mean, it was one, oh my God, <laughs> you know, it was that. And then the other, lost child. The, other, the other part of, of the other moment of the film uh, that you know, it's certainly not noticed by anybody else. And obviously it's a sports thing. It was a shot on the sports, on, on the, on the, uh, uh, the softball uh, game. That yeah, they, I remember that it, too. 
Well, there was a couple of combination shots that I saw immediately when I do it. <clears throat> For one thing, there were two things that happened. There was, um, um, there were shots of the crowd shouting and applauding and doing all this raving thing. And then there was another moment, in fact, when I had, and that was in the film. And then there was another item beforehand or a different part of the game, where they had me at bat, where I actually connected and I hit right on the nose and I had this line drive right over the shortstop's head, a clean line drive base hit, you know, the ones that you really love. In, that uh -huh. in the movie, in the movie, that was shown, I was at bat, but instead of hitting a line drive base hit, there was a little pop-up, you know, that went on and up in the air, which the opposing team second baseman or whatever they caught, and people were shouting at leather. In other words, they had missed the hit, but yeah. And they instead, instead of inserting, they showed at least I was able to know how to swing the they bat properly. They didn't but show the, it go over the fence? No, the butt ah. went nowhere. And but, but the other team was applauding me. I mean, like, <laughs> nice effort, Schmendner, Schmendrick. You know, you can't. <laughs> but it was just personally. But uh, I think there was another there was another hit uh, that I, I mentioned to Trevor Hoey. You know, Trevor, uh, Michael? I mean, sure, he, yeah. I, yeah, I know Trevor. He was out. He was out in left field, and uh, they caught this. Uh, they got a great shot of him running back and 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 making a great catch. Uh, I think I was pitching at the time, uh, and I was applauding his his, uh, his <laughs> a basket catch over the shoulder, very Willie Mays. As he's a, yeah, he's an the, amazing athlete. I just played him in tennis not long ago, and he's very good. Trevor, he's oh, good yeah. at everything. He's yeah. good in football. He's, you yeah. know, what I want to mention now is watching the movie for the first time behind you and your wife in a movie theater. And which, early on, which this movie? Is the movie, very semi serious. Oh, 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 oh. And yeah. I stepped out early on. It, it wasn't my thing that the movie wasn't my thing. And I stepped out to the lobby and um, I waited out in the lobby and the lobby was empty except for one other person, Bob Mankoff. And he was sitting alone in the lobby. And then we sat quiet for a long time until I asked him why we were both sitting in the lobby instead of inside the theater. And he explained it was too painful for him to sit through. And uh, he waited for the movie to end. And then he walked in and I walked in and he went on the stage with you and performed a panel. Well, are you are you wondering why he was thinking that he said that it was painful? Oh, I understand totally, and I, I understand. With his, with of, the sure, son. of course. So, um, I was just sharing that story. Yeah, the, the movie was a very, um, a very emotionally charged movie for a lot of people, and Absolutely. no more than him. Yeah, yeah. No, it was it was very difficult. Yeah. Well, I remember the morning when I, I came in, they had had a, another uh, another interview filming set up for that morning, which they had to cancel. Uh, I think it was CBS or somebody was going to come in and do a lot of stuff. No, I'm sure it was a very, very difficult time. But also, you know, putting that whole film together uh, was, uh, uh, was was a great, a great challenge. There were a lot of people who were whatever, it's always going to happen. You know, they were disappointed. They hated it. They loved it and everything else. Sure. And, and the director herself was going through a lot of personal things. Oh yeah. Challenges. She had just discovered that she had cancer and uh, you know, she had breast cancer and they were going to Paris. And I mean, all kinds of stuff was going on. I actually, over a phone call, I think she's back from Jersey now someplace. I, I liked her very much. And she did a, I thought she did a really great job. Um, uh, as for the film itself, I don't know. Did you, I, I thought it was pretty good. There was another one. Lida Ely did another one. That was one that was done earlier. Um, I forgot what the title of that was. And then somebody else did a third one. That's uh, Sam and I. Uh, uh, Sam and, and Sydney were uh, well featured. In. Yeah. You know, on the bright side, I did get a tote bag out of it. 
Tote bags are good. Yeah, yeah. tote bags. Are no, good. me, me, and Michael are working on a production now, and it's a, it's, it's actually a musical, and it's going to be about the New Yorker, but it's all um, done with dance and the way it should be done. We, we feel like this is now a side that hasn't been told. Yet. Mike, Michael is laughing at you. I'm not sure what that laugh is about. We're calling it the producers part two. <laughs> Well, if you need a hand, let me just sort of drop in as another thing. That One of the things additionally that I was doing when I was up in Alaska, uh, I wrote, directed, and started a musical comedy called Run for the Hills. Oh, which, my. We need a soundtrack. So which, we, we, need, we need a libretto. Let, let, me finish, let me finish the sentence, sure. which is the punchline, which, because I was also editor of the Post newspaper, appointed myself the drama critic and I gave it a smashing review. <laughs> That's talking about control. And I gave it seven this, stars. There's nobody gonna see this without a shame, without a shamed face, I can tell you this. The wonderful part about it is the rest of this that all of this stuff is in that locker and I'll never find it again because I'm here in Colorado and I don't know when we'll ever get back to we're gonna uh, go find that locker for you. The lock? We'll go find it. We'll find it. Huh? Bob's okay. on it. Mort, is there is there anything I can do to help? Well, I'm in New York. Can you think of anything that needs to be done or I could do for uh, you? That's very sweet. That's very sweet of you, Bob. Uh, buy his apartment. You can buy the apartment. Yeah, you too. Also, you can all chip <laughs> in. Yeah, we can. Well, it'll be our hangout. And Marty, come on. We'll all I hate get to it. tell you this, Mort, but I'm in your apartment now. I've been squatting <laughs> for the last week and a half. <laughs> And it really is as nice as you say. I can vouch for that. Terrific. I'm glad. I'm glad. Well, don't go into the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, it's it's on the market as uh, as of uh, two days ago. So uh, I hope we'll have we'll get enough for it so we can move around a little bit. Uh, we were all inoculated. I hope it's uh, easier. Are you all in New York City now? Right to say, oh no, Bob, you're in Pennsylvania. Your house, I'm in right? Pennsylvania, and I'm going to get my second shot soon. Good. And I'm in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Excuse me. Yeah, I, that's what I say. Say it again, backwards. Manitowoc. Manitowoc, Where Wisconsin. It's the uh, Malibu of the Great Lakes. No, that's your boy again. We were in Wisconsin <laughs> once. Uh, I'm so sorry. For friends, for friends <laughs> of, uh, well, it was just for a weekend. It's all right. Okay. We, we, we got all like, uh, friends of Judas were there. We went horseback riding, or she did. Not my thing. I'd Wisconsin's rather... very nice, I have to say. I'm a Midwestern by birth, so Wisconsin is God's country and cheese country. So yeah. there's a lot to like. Listen, I, I have no idea how long this has been going on, but I have to ask, is anybody going to watch this? Uh, we're watching it. I was going to rerun it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we'll have there'll be there'll be a lot of people listening, and I've been getting a lot of uh, feedback and a lot of fan mail saying that they really enjoyed the podcast. So I, the people are going to hear. Are you going to put uh, subtitles on all of this stuff as well? I mean, we you know, always do. We watched uh, Schnitzel last night. Uh, I don't know if you guys are following any of that. But Schnitzel is a uh, uh, Israeli made, uh, I wouldn't call it a sitcom, it's kind of a drama. And the challenge for me uh, is A, um, you know, trying to read the subtitles, which go quickly, and also at the same time trying to listen to and translate some of the Yiddish and alternately the Hebrew that goes on constantly. Oh, my. Yeah. I have watched Schnitzel's Creek. That was quite entertaining. Um, that's different. Okay, Shit's sorry. Creek. Yeah, I, I, okay. I didn't think that was so funny. That's where we are right now, Bob. I see. Okay. Well, do you have any anything <laughs> urgent left? Uh, what time yeah, just it? we want to uh, thank you for joining us. More. Yes, thank you, Mort. This is two hours. Wow, this is. Two yeah, I know you're a, you're our hero. Oh come on, come on, come on! You look I, like I, Nick Fury with that eye patch. I gotta say it. I look like who? Nick Fury, Agent of Shield. Or the uh, Hathaway man. I could have been a Hathaway man. I love that guy. If I had gone to music in on high school, I could have been a Hathaway man. That would have been a yeah. But I didn't even know. So, no more. Uh, more. Let 
let's let you go and thank you so much for doing this it really was a treat and uh it, really i want to thank you for the inspiration you've given me for my work well i'm i'm I tell you one 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 parting thing I am appreciative is something like what you just said, and I, uh, I mean it's a sort of an emotional thing. Like you have one one copy of car my cartooning book in your car and one in the house. Uh, the the cartooning book has been out of print for a million years, uh, and it really does give me a great feeling of having made some kind of a contribution someplace along the line when these children, and I have to say that they're children, uh, whom I, you know, sometimes have met at the New Yorker when I was there, who are, you know, going through the motions, at least, of being cartoonists, uh, would recognize me as the person who did the book that they think is still very good, even though what they're doing doesn't seem to reflect anything that they have, if they've looked at it or learned it or something, because those those ideas and precepts seem a little bit um, almost antique at this point, but I still believe them and I still believe the people who really care about uh, cartooning uh, as an art form, uh, you know, will still continue to subscribe to them regardless of what else is going on, uh, you know, in the commercial world. So um, that award that you mentioned before about from uh, the, the Gill Award from the cart uh, from the uh, National Cartoonist Society was really very much appreciated by me, uh, as largely because of that book. So, uh, you know, when they, they see throwing dirt on me, they'll still, you know, the book will still be uh, not making any money, as it never did. Uh, but somehow people will still find it. And I think that's, uh, thank you for mentioning it and uh, keeping it alive in that sense. You know. And for your, you know, recognition, whatever. Okay. All right. Thanks again for inviting me. Thank you all for uh, going hungry for the last, last two hours. Yes, thank you, Mark. And we're on to it uh, then. Be well. Be we'll talk well. soon. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Good talk. Uh, so, Michael, how was that? Uh, it feels like we could have went like five or six hours with Mort. Oh, Lord. He could, he, he outlasted us. He did. And think about all the careers he had. He was in film and he did writing and he did uh, the books. I mean, 45 books he taught, which he never even mentioned much about. All the cartoons, multi-paneled stuff. And now he's a pirate. And he skied in the Olympics. He's training for the 2021 Olympics in Tokyo. God bless him and good luck. Yes. Skiing and ping pong. Well, I think on that note, let's say goodnight to everyone. Thanks, cartoonists and cartoon lovers. Uh, stay well, stay funny. And get jabbed. <laughs>